I would probably open tonight or today asking, has anybody ever had writer's block before? Um, and part of my job is, is writing out things. And uh, occasionally the Lord will put something on my heart that he wants me to get out. And I tell you what, I, I looked at a blank computer screen for a while. And I was like, you know what, I'll sleep on this and my mind will open up. Opened the next day, nothing. For effect. No, uh, nothing. And uh, it wasn't actually till this morning that the Lord helped me kind of complete the thought. So um, you pray <laughs> that the Lord will help me get this out in the manner in which he would uh, be most pleased with. So let's pray this morning. Father, we come to you today and uh, we are thankful that you have given us health, that you've given us breath, that you've given us the ability to be in your house this morning. Lord, we look at all the blessings we have in this life, and we, we realize without you, we can do nothing. Father, we are fortunate people. We are blessed people, God. And we come to your throne this morning, and we are just wanting to praise you and thank you for being a great God. You are the great I am. You are the I am to all of our needs and all of our problems. Father, as we come today, we do desire to lift the name of Jesus high. God, we come to you tonight or today and we ask that Jesus' name would be sweet. Um, God, to us, that our, our hearts would, would burn with a desire to know Christ more. And I pray that you would take me uh, just a worthless vessel and that you'd fill me with yourself. Help me to be hid behind the cross. And I pray that, Lord God, you would preach through me and that we would leave here with, uh, with a sense of heaven uh, and more like Christ. Lord, we love you and it's in Jesus. Jesus name we ask these things by faith believing amen all right if you have your Bible Luke chapter 13 this morning Luke chapter 13 the title of the sermon before we read it is the parable of the fig tree the parable of the fig barren fig tree Luke chapter 13 we'll read just a few verses to get kind of context here uh, and the real sermon is going to be verses uh, 6 all the way through verse 9 so Luke chapter number 13 and uh, the word of God says, There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He killed them. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you nay or no, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower of Siloam fell, uh, and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Verse number six is where our sermon starts. And he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Verse number seven, and he said unto the uh, dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? Why is it even here? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall also dig about it and dung it. And if it it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. The parable of the fig tree. Now, in chapter 13, Christ is really teaching on the importance of repentance. What is repentance? Well, a simple way of understanding repentance is to uh, understand like a change of mind, a change of direction. Uh, yesterday, uh, we were, or I think it was Friday night, we were going to get some coffee. Uh, and we, we found that, uh, I think it's Cafe Royale, is that the place? They close at 7. So we said, man, I want to stay up and talk and drink some coffee and just be be folksy and be you know just enjoy my just enjoy my time after work I want to have some fellowship time and but they close at seven I can't fellowship I got to fellowship till nine that's just I got to eat a donut and have some fellowship or something and, and then so what I ended up doing is because cafe cafe royale closed at seven we went ahead and put in the GPS uh, Jack's Donuts because they're open late and they got coffee supposedly right um, so we we go and um, we changed our minds and changed our directions that's repentance and uh, to, to a lost person repentance is understanding that you're going your way in unbelief but life closes at seven 
right? And you have to realize that there is another way that you can go that's open much later in eternity, right? Um, and you change your mind about your unbelief, and you put your faith and trust in Christ. The importance of repentance, and I wrote a few things down. Uh, Jesus' teaching on the importance of repentance and shows that all men need it. It is important because Jews thought that if a person suffered a great tragedy, then they must be a great sinner. Uh, you, you, you look at the book of Job, and <laughs> I, I pray that no one has the friends that Job has. You know, Job goes through the whirlwind, right? Job loses family, friends, he, he loses money, he loses influence, and his friends call him a sinner. That's the reason, Job, why you're suffering, because you're a sinner. That was just a, a Jewish thing. They thought, if you suffered greatly, you must be a great sinner, but that is, that is false. Um, they must be guiltier of the sin than others. That's not true. Um, what about this story? Christ is saying, well... You know, Pilate murdered uh, some Galileans that were at the temple, and they ended up being murdered while they were uh, worshiping the God, while, while they were uh, offering their sacrifices. So their blood mingled with the sacrifices. Were they guiltier than other Galileans? No. But what about the, the Tower of Siloam, where this freak accident, a tower falls on 18 people during that day and just kills them? Were they guiltier um, of sin than anyone else in Jerusalem? No, Christ says, but I tell you, except if you, know, if you don't repent, you'll likewise perish. You know, um, the Jews thought that, you know, I guess good things happen to good people. That's not necessarily true. Um, we have a tendency to say that there are good people and there are bad people. Um, and good things should happen to good people and bad things should happen to bad people because that's just the way order the order of the universe. That's not true. What Christ is saying is that all men are guilty. Not some are guiltier than others. All men are guilty before a thrice holy God. And we all must repent. You know, there, there is a, a religious uh, group in, in every church, and hopefully not in this church, that is lost who make a false profession of faith and they never get it right because they're better than somebody else. They're not as sinful as somebody else. All the bad things happen to that person, so they must be doing bad. I'm okay. I don't need to get saved because I'm doing good. That's a false, that's a false idea. We all need to change our mind about unbelief and come to Christ. We're tempted to think certain things. Christ rejects that idea. Um, I also wrote, it's not that some people, the bad people, need to repent, but all men need to repent. Not that some are great sinners and others are good people. All men are sinners and need repentance. So Christ uses a parable to help us understand the need of turning to God and away from unbelief. So with God's help this morning, I'd like to preach on the parable of the barren fig tree. You know, Christ is the master teacher. I am a visual person. I, I need to see things on paper for me to understand them. How many of you would like that with math? Anybody? You know, you know, somebody could say A plus B equals C, and you're like, Ugh. can you write the letter A for me? I need, <laughs> I need to see the letter A so I can understand what A represents. I am a visual person. I think Christ understands with spiritual things. We need to be led along by, with kid gloves. We need to be uh, shown pictures of something to understand great truths. So with God's help, I'd like to preach on a simple picture, but a great truth, the need of repentance, or the, the barren fig tree. Number one, let's talk about first the worthless tree. Look at your Bible here. The worthless tree. Um, in our parable here, let me make sure I've got this right. Verse number six, it says, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found, what's that word? None. And then he said unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? So we have to, let's understand the outline here. A guy makes an investment. He has some land that he bought that is super fruitful. It's a vineyard. There's a lot growing there. He takes his time. He takes his money. He takes his stuff and invests in a fig tree because fig trees are a good investment. I I think they, they, they produce fruit most all the year. I think, I think I read that. They're a great investment. I don't like figs. Don't give me fig newtons as a present. No, I'm good. But in that, in that arid climate, they grow, they grow all year long. Great. So he goes, I'm going to make an investment. I want to be able to have a huge fig tree, and I want to sell it. So he digs it. He dungs it. Right. He's investing time and money. And it says for three years, he goes back, and he's digging, and he's dunging, and he's 
and he's digging and he's talking to it. He's watering it. He's loving that tree. Grow. Grow for me. Please produce. And the tree just goes, no. I'm not going to grow. I'm not going to do anything. I have a dog like that. You know, we, we love that dog. We pet that dog. We do good things for that dog. Please obey. No. I'm going to do what I want. You know, and, and that tree produces nothing. And for three years he comes. And it seems like almost every morning he shows up. Nope. Nothing again. Nothing again. How many of you all have ever made a bad investment? Maybe it's time, maybe it's friendship, maybe it's money, but you spend and are spent. And then the time for payoff comes, nothing. You know, and we identify with the, we identify with the vineyard guy, we go, well, I spent time, I'm hemorrhaging money, there's nothing good coming out of this, I'm losing money every day. Let's get rid of it. Let's cut our losses. Let's be done with it. We understand what this owner is going through, right? It is a worthless investment. He's wasting his time. It's not worth it. It's fruitless. Can I say that this owner of the vineyard is a picture of the Heavenly Father? And the barren tree is a picture of lost people. And I believe this is truly a picture of people that are in church but have never made a personal decision to trust Christ. Like that fig tree. If you ever look at a fig tree, they have huge leaves. They make a big profession, right? I'll join the church. I'll get baptized. I'll say a prayer, but I've never, I've made a mental ascent that God, that Jesus is God, but he's never been personally mine. I've never asked him to save me. I believe he's God, but I've never asked him to take me to heaven when I die. I'll make a big profession. I'll make a big offering. I'll show up to every activity and serve so that everybody thinks that I'm this great, big, fruitful tree, but on the inside, I'm lost. I'm fruitless. I'm a worthless inventor. I am a sinner, unredeemed, unregenerate. Um, and the owner says, cut my losses. Uh, God has invested his grace and mercy into our lives. His providential hand has supplied our needs. He's delivered us time and time again. He's kept us. His goodness has led us to repentance. But in this scenario, they refuse to accept him. He has given them good things. He has dug around us. You know, I think about um, there was there was Spurgeon was talking about when you dig around a root, you try to loosen its hold on the ground. You know, sometimes God allows sickness to come in a person's life so that their hold on the temporal loosens a little bit and they look upward. Sometimes God allows hard times to come in our lives to have our eyes look upward and say, he is my source. He is my sufficiency. And with lost people, God daily, the Bible says that he, God is angry with sin every day. But yet, he daily pours out his blessings. Yet, he pours out his grace. He pours out his love. If you will, he digs around you with the gospel. He sends a, a, a stupid guy like me, a fat guy like me, to come preach the gospel. I'm sorry, I shouldn't talk down about myself, right? But he sends a preacher to come dig about and to pour over you with tears and with, and with concern and to preach the gospel and to say, repent, come to Christ and get saved. And when he digs around us with love, he digs around us and he supplies, if you will, the dung, the fertilizer. He supplies our needs. His goodness leads us to repentance. But time and time again, like that unfruitful tree, we say, no, I refuse. We, we are taking up space in his vineyard. Catch what I'm saying? You think about this on a car lot. You want to know why you can really negotiate if you really push? Because at the end of the day, you have a vehicle that's in a spot that is costing them money the longer they keep it. There's new vehicles. They're always wanting to get in, right? That's why they always say, here, if you ever want to learn something in church, they always say buy a car at the end of the year because they're trying to get rid of their inventory to get the newer models in, right? And the idea is that is taking up vital real estate that they can use to make money on. Catch this. The vineyard, right? Fruitful land. Good land. The master's hand is on it. And lost people, if you will, are just sitting there using up the time, using up the resources, using up the love, and never yielding to the master's hand. Never believing. Taking up vital vital, uh, vital goodness, right? You think about this. How, how good is God to us? He daily, the Bible says, loads us with benefits. He, he 
is merciful. He is, he, at the end of God, He is full of pity, right? He loves us. He cherishes us. He leads us. And if you're saved, He gives His angels charge over you, right? He is constantly loving. He's constantly digging about in your life. He's constantly pouring out three years, right, of love and attention and grace and wonder and answering prayers and being good to you and just loving and loving and loving and pulling you to Himself and saying, repent, come to me, get saved. I gave my son for you. Come to me. I'm digging about in your life. I'm bringing stuff in your life to have you look at me. I'm supplying your need so that my goodness will lead you to Christ. Come to me. I'm digging about in your life. I'm digging about in your life. Come to Christ and get saved. I gave my son. He died for you. He was buried and he rose again. And if you'll put your faith and trust in him, you'll be fruitful. You'll be worth it. You'll be worth my investment. I pause and I look at Christians and I say, how many times are we not worth his investment? (laughs) Beloved, if you're saved this morning, how much fruit have we borne in his vineyard? Our love, our patience, right? But I, I pause and I go back. If you're without Christ this morning, as a sinner, you're worthless without him. You're unfruitful without him. You're a sinner, unregenerate, waiting for the fell of the axe. You are under his judgment. You are worthless in his garden. Clarence Sexton, a great Bible teacher, said this. If there's no fruit in your life, there's one of two problems. Either you're not born again or you're not abiding in the Lord. Ask yourself, am I born again? Has there ever been a change in my life? Have I ever truly asked Christ to be my Savior? Have I ever made the decision to say, I can't save myself. I'm a sinner. I need Christ. I cast myself on Jesus to save me. Has there ever been a time where you've been born again? Has there ever been a time when you've yielded to the Master's hand? Amen. There are many that show up to church a few times, but they're unchanged. They're lost, they're barren trees, and they take up God's valuable land, breathe his air, eat up his resources, and they're under the threat of the axe. Without God, we're worthless, fruitless trees, useless, unless we are ta- attached to the vine, which is Christ. We never produce. We never, we must realize that our worthlessness. We are worthless before an almighty God. Think about this. Without Christ, we are nothing. Christ is all, Colossians says. And Christ said, I am the vine. You are the branches. Imagine if if I take a tree and I just cut it from its source. What's going to happen to that branch? It's going to die, right? Apart from Christ, sin has severed us from fellowship with God. And we're just that old, shriveled up, brown, nasty, fruitless branch. But Christ is saying, I want to attach you back in by faith. I want you to be at the source of blessing again. Come to me by faith. Don't be worthless. Come to me and I will make you fruitful eternally. The worthless tree. I want you to consider that. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of our righteousness are as filthy rags. And then the Bible says, There is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. You know, people oftentimes get puffed up. I'm educated. I'm wealthy. I'm fine. I don't need God. Listen, without Christ, you're nothing. I don't care how much education you have. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how much position you have in the community. I don't care how many friends you have. I don't care what your name is in this community. If you do not have Christ, you're like a fruitless tree. All show, all leaves, no fruit. Worthless investment without Christ. Fit for the fire. Christ is all today. So not only the worthless tree, but my favorite part is the wonderful intercessor. Number two, the wonderful intercessor. Look at verse eight. And if you can imagine the picture here, and he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. God the Father is pictured as as the vine, as the vineyard owner. But you know who I believe the vine dresser is a picture of? Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
our great intercessor. So catch the picture here. Like we're, we're talking pictures here. There's a vineyard. A, a, a vine, a, you know, the vineyard owner spends time and money. He, he plants this by choice. He plants it. He seeks after it. He wants the good of this plant. The plant refuses. And he goes, you know what? I've spent three years loving you. I've poured out my blessings on you. And you've said no to me. You refuse my hand. You're fit for the axe. And I can just imagine the axe coming back and the hand saying, let it alone one year. Let it alone one year. Let me tell you something. There's one reason why you're not in hell right now. It's because the hand that was pierced has got between the root and the almighty sword of God's justice and said, let it alone one year. Let it alone one year. And if you're sitting here this morning and the Holy Spirit of God is, is dealing with your heart and the Holy Spirit will never ask you, are you sure you're saved? The Holy Spirit will declare your need of Christ. You're lost. You need to be saved. And if you can imagine... Christ's hand is separating you from the judgment, the acts that surely and deservedly needs to fall on the root. It, all, by all means, economically it makes sense. Listen, spiritually it makes sense. We're sinners against God. The soul that sinned, the Bible says, it shall die. It's, it's a plan and purpose of God. If you sin against me, it's death and hell. But Jesus Christ, our advocate, has separated himself between the acts and the root by his cross. Right? He's stretched out and said, Father, give them time. Father, give me a year to dung it, to dig around it. Let my goodness draw them a little while longer. There are people that I pray for that are lost. And my prayer is, God, give them space to repent. This preacher is going to get up, and if you're lost, and I know if, you're, and if you come to me and say, Peter, I'm not saved, but I don't want to make a decision, I guarantee you this preacher is going to be before God saying, God, withhold another year. God, give space to repent. God, work in their hearts so they come to Christ. God, don't let the axe fall. Listen, the axe falls quickly. One moment, our breath stops. We, you know, we don't know what this life brings, right? Who knows what a day may bring forth? Your heart could stop. You can have a car accident. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that's going to happen, right? But what I'm saying is we don't know what life brings. The ax is quick like that. But our Savior has interposed himself between the judgment of God and us and is calling, come to Christ. Come to me. I will save you from the judgment that you deserve. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Where are you at right now? In the throes of judgment, our holy advocate raises his voice. Let it alone another year. Let me dig it. Let me dung it. Give them a little while longer. I will hold that ground as much as I can. I will pour out my blessings as much as I can. How many of us waited to get saved? Maybe we sat in a church and we heard our need of salvation. We said, not today. Not today. I, I, that was me. Not today. I grew up in a Catholic background. Not today. I almost died. Had a realization that, man, life is short. And I thought, what if I had actually died when I was 14 years old? No more opportunities. No more opportunities. But I'm glad my Savior said, let it alone one year. Catch the example here. If you're saved this morning, if you've come to Christ, it is not because of anything you have brought to the table. It is only because of the matchless grace of Almighty God. We forget. Sometimes we get so puffed up in ourselves. Well, God should have saved me. How dare we think we're something before a thrice holy God. We're sinners. We're wretched before him. Listen, uh, we have our flesh fighting against our new man every day. There's not a man on this earth that, that does good and sins not, right? We are constantly fighting our sinful desires. We're constantly battling that, that thorn, that sin thorn in our flesh, right? We're constantly trying to battle our minds that want to be at enmity with God. Listen, you say, well, I'm not a great sinner. Have you loved God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all your mind every day of your life, every hour of your life? No. Why? Because you're a we're a bunch of carnal goats. We're a bunch of goats that are, 
are trying to do our own thing. We're trying to live apart from God. And the, and the God Spirit has to draw us to, our, to himself and try to make us stay on the altar. There are people who say, well, I won't serve God. I've got my own things to do. You want to know why? Because you're carnal. I'm carnal. You want to know why? Sometimes Wednesday night I come to church and my body doesn't want to be here and I don't want to be here and I'm not as spiritual as I should be. The preacher on Wednesday night, I have to battle myself. You want to know why? Because my nature is I'm a sinner. I deserve hell. I'm an enmity with God without him. And it is only by the space of his grace that I ever got anything good. The worthless tree, but aren't you glad that we have a withholding of judgment? The, withhold, the wonderful intercessor. Why should you live another moment and have a chance to be saved because of our mediator, our advocate? Listen, sometimes we forget how good Jesus really is. If we all got a glimpse of hell, we would never... We would never leave his service. If we, got, if we were to have just a peek, a two-second peek at where we should have been for all of eternity, then this story to us would stir up the fires in our heart. Thank God that Jesus interposed himself between me and judgment. Thank God that I don't have to burn forever and ever and ever and ever and be in the bottomless pit where the smoke ascendeth forever and ever, where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of tears, where there's when there's no rest day or night where the judgment of God falls forever and ever and ever and ever and it has never changed all because Christ said wait give them time they deserve the axe punish me in their stead I'll take their sin I'll take their judgment I'll take their hell give them time and I plead with you, if you do not know Christ, if you're playing church, stop it. The need of repentance, except ye also likewise repent, ye shall also perish. You're not a good person. I'm not a good person. We're all guilty before a thrice holy God. And there is only one way given among men whereby we must be saved. And that is Jesus Christ, our Lord. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by who? <coughs> but by me, by him. Come to the Savior this morning. And then lastly, we'll be done. So you have the worthless tree, the wonderful intercessor, and very simply, the warning. Look at this last verse in verse number nine. And if it bear fruit, well, great. And if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. Can I warn you? Listen, I love preaching. I love preaching sweet sermons. I love preaching about the grace of God. I love preaching about salvation. I love it. It's one of the great things about being a preacher. But you know what? Sometimes I got to talk about things nobody likes. That's part of the job. I don't mind it. God called me to do it. Can I warn you? Can I, if you will, take my garden hoe? Can I dig a little bit for one second? Can I, with God's help, can we dig for one second? Can we uproot, uproot those roots for just one second so you get to oh, look up a little bit, let your grip grow, uh, go a little bit off that ground and look up? If you don't repent and come to Christ for salvation, the axe is laid at the root. One second after death, there will be, once that axe falls, hear me, once the axe falls, there's no more rejection. Once the axe falls, there's no more time. Once the axe falls, there's no hope. Once the axe falls, there's no escape. Once the axe falls, you are constantly, forever under the immutable judgment. Immutable means unchanging. The immutable judgment of God. Once the axe falls, and he says, listen, here's the story. It deserves it. There's no reason why you should keep it. You spent a lot of money on it. I understand. But just give me an opportunity to dig about. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't, okay. Listen, God bears long, but he will not bear forever. Hear me. God will bear long, but he will not bear long forever. Listen, if somebody smacks us in the face, unless you're a hothead, 
probably going to call the police. And All right, well, you're going to jail, buddy. But if somebody is constantly smoting us and hitting us and pushing us, not, it's not going to take too long for us to fight back. It's not going to take too long. Unless somebody besmirches us, our natural reaction is to constantly fire back. That's our flesh. But how about us with God? We constantly offend Him as a lost person. We constantly reject His Son. We constantly run from His grace. Have you ever tried to, to talk to somebody and you put your hand on their shoulder and they pull their shoulder away because they don't want anything to do with you? That's happened to me before. Hey... We constantly, as an unregenerate, lost person, we do that to our God. We pull our shoulder away. We say we don't want him. We reject his sacrifice. And all the while, he's saying, just a little while longer. Just a little while longer. Just a little while longer. Give them another day. Give them another hour. Just let, listen, they're going to church this morning. I'm going to help the preacher preach. And the Holy Spirit's going to draw them. Just give them another opportunity. Let me dig about one more Sunday. Maybe today's your last Sunday. Oh, God, maybe today is your last Sunday where God is digging at your heart and he's saying, you know you're lost. You know that you need to be saved. Stop playing games. Well, what if I come forward? People will know. Well, hallelujah, somebody will know. Hallelujah that, I, that God took a sinner and made him a saint. And you say, well, I can't come forward. People will think different of me. Yeah, they will. They'll say, hallelujah, somebody got saved from hell. Listen, there's nobody in here that will look at you cross. You want to know why? Because church isn't about a, a social club or a comedy club or even a friar's dinner. Church is about sinners getting saved. And today might be your last Sunday. And I can imagine the vine dresser saying, let it alone. Let it alone. Let it alone. I have a, I have a, a guy I met. He's a preacher. He knew he needed to get saved. He was sitting in church after church. He was walking down the road, walking out of the church, and there was the, the split in the concrete there. And there's the split right there. And it was like God's Spirit told him, He says, if you take one more step in that direction, that's it. No more. The scariest thing is that day when God stops drawing you. When God says, okay, let it go. I tried. I gave it four years. I gave you 70 years. I gave you 50 years. I gave you 20 years. I gave you opportunity after opportunity. I put people in your life. You wouldn't listen. The Bible was preached. You wouldn't listen. The Holy Spirit of God drew you. You wouldn't listen. You said, my, my perception in the community, my perception in this church is more than what, what, what I care about, about me getting saved. The axe is laid. The axe is laid. Is this, is this what you're going to hear for all of eternity? The axe is laid. The axe is laid this morning. Listen to the mediating Savior. Maybe you only have an hour. Maybe it's this hour where he said, I'm going to call Peter Ryan from Nashville to... Indiana, of all places. I never thought I'd be up here. I'm going to move him in his life, his family from New England to Virginia. I'm going to bring him to college so he can learn how to preach the gospel. I'm going to make him serve under a man who loves people. And I'm going to move him by my providence up to this church for this moment right now so that you could hear, except if you don't repent, you'll perish likewise. God's providence is available every moment of our lives. But there is coming a second, one moment after death, when the axe falls, and that's it.